because you're about to listen to The Sick Podcast with Tony Maradero. 55 seconds left in the penalty, a minute and 27 seconds left in regulation time. Boston 4, Montreal 3. Lafleur coming out rather gingerly on the right side. He gives it into the mayor, back to Lafleur. The sickest Montreal Canadiens podcast. <laughs> You're in the ball. Sports entertainment like no other. Rejoint, on lui fait perdre la rondelle, une passe devant. Et c'est Allez, bon, c'est 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 bon, And all together, they worked the young team to the top. And now, a 24th Stanley Cup banner will hang from the rafters of the famous forum in Montreal. The Canadians win the Stanley Cup. Brought to you by Energy Transportation Group. Driven to be different. 8.6 beer. Intense by nature. And Lacage. If the last time you went to the Lacage was when the Habs won the cup, it's time you went back to Lacage. It's going to be sick. Marinero, the sick podcast on this, um, what is it? It's Tuesday night, actually. It's December the 13th. It's one minute past 10 o'clock, and uh, we have a big one tonight because it was several weeks ago that former Montreal Canadiens equipment manager Pierre Gervais came out with his book, this is what it looks like. Huh? Pierre Gervais, Au Coeur du Vestiaire. This is the edition in French. And uh, there has since been uh, an English edition that has been launched, written by my buddy Mathias Brunet of La Presse newspaper. And I was actually there. At, they had a sans cassette at the Bell Center. It was very, very nice. And uh, I was there for that. And I had a chance to catch up with Pierre that night. And I said, we got to get you on the podcast. So I spoke to uh, Matthias, and we uh, we did what we had to do, and Pierre is going to be joining me any minute now. The SICK Podcast brought to you in part by Energy Transportation Group. Are you in transportation sales, customer service, operations, HR, or admin? Well, the good news is Energy Transportation Group is hiring for all positions. As is custom, it's three days in a row now I sneeze, but thankfully I have a, a mute button here on the uh, on the mixer. Uh, graciously provided by uh, the folks at Ericsson. Thank you very much for that. Also brought to you in part by 8.6 Beer, Intense by Nature, the beer for those who follow their instinct and live their passions in order to make their mark. And Lacage, if the last time you went to Lacage was when Pierre Gervais won the Stanley Cup as a member of the Montreal Canadiens back in 1993, well, it's time you go back to Lacage because the menu will surprise you. Uh, I'll let you know this, that I have a, I've had a chance to actually once again, I've had the book for about three weeks. I've had a chance to read the book. I've read the entire book. So uh, I'm well prepared for this one. And uh, I look forward to it. And there's a few things that I'm dying to find out. And there's probably a few things that are not in the book. And uh, maybe Pierre will or will not talk about it. But, you know, in life, they say that if you don't ask, uh, you'll never find out. And so if you have any questions, and I know you're following right now uh, via Facebook Live, via Twitter live and via YouTube live. And if you're not subscribed to our YouTube channel, please do so. Tell your friends about it. So hello to everyone. And I see biggest Habs fan in the big smoke. Hello, uh, Chris. Hello, Joe D. Kelly, Ryan, another Ryan and another Ryan, Ryan Baker, Ryan Katz. No, no, it's Ryan Baker again. Greg M. K. Wolf. Flower Sofa, all of you, good evening, and thanks for joining me on the Sick Podcast. I mentioned this to you yesterday, by the way. I know a lot of you that follow me here have followed me for quite some time and used to follow me when I was working English sports radio and uh, have decided to join me for this journey here on the Sick Podcast, and for that I say thank you. And I know a lot of you, based on all the messages that I've uh, had a chance, I've received and I've had a chance to read. I know a lot of you were big fans of myself, and not only myself, but also of Chris Nyland. And I've had several requests. Hey, um, why don't you and Nyland do something together? Well, I'll tell you this. Knuckles and I, um, Knuckles will be on the SIP podcast tomorrow night. All right? So tomorrow night, 10 o'clock, 
For the first time in 11 months, Knuckles and I will be talking Montreal Canadiens hockey uh, on a platform where you'll be able to listen and you'll be able to watch. For the first time in 11 months, I'm so looking forward to this first conversation. Who knows what's going to be said? Who knows what's going to be brought up? Um, but, you know, we'll just go with the flow, as we always do with Knuckles. And uh, Chris and I were talking about it. Chris has a great podcast himself. It's called Raw Knuckles. If you haven't watched it yet, I encourage you to do so. I like it very much. I think Chris is really in his element with the podcast. And I think it's a great, great thing that he has going. So Knuckles and I have talked about it. We know that we're wanted here by popular demand. I know you'd like to see us together. So we worked out a little bit of a deal here where Nux is going to join me semi-regularly, I hope. And I'm going to join on the sick podcast and I'm going to join Knuckles semi-regularly on Raw Knuckles. All right. So without further ado, um, we'll, uh, let's get to tonight's guest. Once again, he's the former equipment manager at the Montreal Canadiens. I showed you his book. It looks like this 35 plus years with the Habs now retired. And I imagine enjoying retirement, Pierre Gervais. How you doing, Pierre? Good evening. How are you? Doing Pierre, great. Are you on your cell phone? Yes. Why don't we do this if possible? Okay, if possible, we could continue like this. But if you actually turn your phone sideways, turn the phone. There we go. Look at that. You're on the whole screen now. This is good. Fantastic. I, I see the wine. Co- is that the wine collection or? Uh, that's older bottles. That's I've been drunk before. All right. Okay. Uh, are you holding the phone or you got something that it can stand up with? I am. I'm good. You're good? You sure? I, I want to keep you for about 45 minutes, Pierre. I don't want you to hold the phone. 45 for... minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Let's we have a lot to get to, and so I'll try to uh I'll try and get to it. Thanks for doing this, Pierre. Uh, My pleasure. the book, of course, has a lot of people talking and a lot of people buying the book, which is great. I'm very happy for you and for Matthias because of that success that you're having with book sales. I mean, they can't stay on the shelves long enough. They're 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 selling like hotcakes. There has been some controversy because, of course, anytime you say something a little bit negative about someone, whether it be reality true or not, it's it's not always taken well. I have to ask you this. Any regrets? Not at all. Not at all. Uh, When Matthias talked to me about 15 years ago uh, to do a book, he offered me, if ever you want to do a book, I'd like to be the one that write it. And uh, in my mind, there was no way that I was that I was going to do a book. But last two, three, four years, I had so many people like asking me to to do a book, to to share what I did, what I lived, you know. So uh, and and then I told Matthias, if I ever do a book, I'm going to do the real thing. I'm not going to do the phony thing, the real thing about the truth, the, the, just the truth, you know. So, uh, and then last spring, after I was uh, retired, I told Matthias, it's time, it's time to do it. So I did it and we, we did it and we did the real thing. So that's, it is what it is. When you, when you see the real thing, obviously you don't please everybody, but I just can't say the real thing about one guy, not the other guy and kind of choose, you know? So, uh. We did it, and I'm pleased with it. What do you say to those who say Pierre was in a position of privilege? He was privy to certain things. There's a certain code. What's said in the room should stay in the room and not go in a book. I don't. If you if you you read the book, right? I did. So I read I the whole book. I don't tell any secrets. There is nobody that can say that uh, Jerv. I thought it was between you and I, or you know, something like that. Nothing at all. So the very first people that went to my throat, literally, without reading the book, uh, now they know what I mean. They know, you know, they saw the title. They thought, like, they thought like for 35 years, I kept my mouth shut, didn't say anything, and then hell of a sudden, the floodgate was open. And it's not the case at all. Not at all. I mean... I'm saying things the way I saw it. There's no big secrets. There's a lot of fun stories. A lot of, I, I went as far as I could 
in every aspect of my career. And I think it's been interesting, honestly. A, a big secret would have been you saying, hey, by the way, when we used to go on the road, there was uh, always a girl waiting for this guy or this guy always. That would be a big secret. And and you're e right. Exactly. You, 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 and, you, and, and you know what, Tony? Nothing personal in that book. Yeah. Nothing personal. It's not about hockey. Nothing personal. Nothing. That would be so easy. That would have been so easy to. Yeah. Pe people know me better. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not my type of guy, you know. It's, yeah, no, uh, no. I, I, I understand that. And I have to tell you. That when I was at your the the book launch when you did the sank set okay, at the yeah. Bell Center, okay, I, I I said to myself, I said, wow, um, and I'm not gonna, I'm I'm a straight shooter too, right? So I'll tell you, I said to myself, I said, wow, I, I'm surprised he wrote the book because, uh, uh, you know, I wouldn't have done it. And um, and there's some things I want to talk to you about, but I have to say that after reading the book, it's not as bad as you would think after hearing a lot of interviews and a lot of things that were said and stuff like mm -hmm. that because you're right. Um, you, you didn't share a lot of secrets or whatever and stuff like that. You did give your personal opinion on who was a good guy and who was a bad guy and who was nice yep. and who wasn't and who was a good yep. captain and who had an ego that surprised me a little bit, but I have to tell you, I'm sure the fans really appreciate it because, you know, they got your opinion on something that was very, very close to you. Okay. So let's go through it if we can, as quickly as we can. Yep. So you get your break with Michel Bergeron, who happened to be your neighbor. Yep. Back in the days in the Trois Rivières, uh, Michel bought the house, the next house to my parents. And I was a hockey fan. I was, uh, you know, I was going to the, to see the practices and all that, the game. And then uh, Michel moved in and uh, I kind of uh, asked his, I was too shy to talk to Michel, so I asked his wife. Uh, if I, you know, if I could give a hand one day to, uh, you know, whatever, fill up the water bottles, whatever. I was 15 year old back then. Yeah. And then the uh, eldest son, he asked me, uh, he had his training camp in Montreal here back in 1978. And he asked my parents. So I, uh, I came in Montreal, I did the camp and then, uh, I did my best, my very, very best every single day, every minute. And when we get back, he asked me, well, maybe you should uh, stay a little more, you know, there's just uh, home practices and maybe home games. And uh, so, you know, all of a sudden, I, I, I stayed with the team, uh, the 12 yard driver back then, mm -hmm. uh, for two years, an assistant, and as an assistant. And then uh, I move on. When Michel left for uh, Quebec City, I went to uh, Sherbrooke uh, Beavers. Uh, they needed somebody there, so I went there even if I, if, even if I was very young, and then uh, I got my break you know, mm -hmm. as a real job in Sherbrooke. Yeah, and you end up with the Sherbrooke Canadians. You're there in the spring, and Eddie Palchuk's health was not 100%. Yeah. So Serge Savard comes calling for help. You end up going up with the big team, and it's a great time to join them because you're part of that 86 Cup. Exactly. I, um, I remember I got the call from Serge. And uh, we didn't make the playoffs. We won the, the, the Calder Cup in uh, Sherbrooke in 85. And uh, we didn't make the playoff in 86. And um, I remember telling my wife back then, uh, I said, uh, you know, the team wasn't very good. We, did, we did, You know, they barely made the, made the playoff. And I told my wife, well, I'll be gone for a couple of weeks at the most. So for a couple of weeks at the most. So, I mean, and then <laughs> it ended up being two months uh, I left something beautiful. It was my first uh, taste of the NHL and the NHL traveling and playoffs and all that. And uh, that was amazing. So uh, that was a great experience with uh, with Eddie. And then yeah. the, the following year, I just I, I became a Montreal Canadiens. Pierre, in 86, I was 13 years old. And that's when I really was a fan because I didn't make it into the media until full time, probably in my late 20s. And at that point, I, I think I went a little bit more neutral. But I was a big fan as a 13-year-old, 1986, who can forget it? Three straight games versus the Boston Bruins. I remember Cordick versus Miller. I remember uh, Game 7 versus the Hartford Whalers. Cole Lemieux from behind the net, that famous line of Screwland, McPhee, and Lemieux. I remember yeah. in five versus the New York Rangers and Patrick Waugh was absolutely unbelievable in Game 3 at Madison Square Garden. Indeed he, indeed. he made several glove saves, one of them off of Mike Ridley, which was spectacular. Claude Lemieux wins it again in overtime on a 2-on-0 with Mike McPhee. And I remember versus the Calgary Flames, 
They uh, they lose game one. They go on to win four in a row and game five in Calgary. Uh, I remember Rick Green scoring a goal to put the Canadians up by a score of three to one, which didn't happen often, right? Yeah. Uh, th- those were the good old days. Um, Jean Perron is in the book because, of course, he was the, the coach of that cup team. But you mentioned in the book, and we had heard this before, that the veterans of the team really took things into their own hands. Ganey, Robinson, uh, I believe you wrote Rick Green, and... Uh, Carbono and, and, and Knuckles yeah. and all those yeah, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk to me about that. So, you know, you, you said a story where Jean would explain the tactics... And then if you would leave the room, the guys would like just talk about the tactics yeah, amongst themselves. And Yeah. Those are the things that, uh, Tony, that I don't really like to bring up. But okay. I had to. I had to. Because uh, he's not a bad guy. He's a nice guy. He's a nice, yeah, you know, for a sure. nice, nice person. But it is what it is. And it was what it was. So uh, I was kind of surprised, very surprised when I when I got there to see how little it was taken by veterans. You know, it was, uh, I, I guess he came after Jacques Lemaire, right? And yes. then Jacques Lemaire was Jacques Lemaire and uh, Jean was a, an assistant coach. And uh, we got to we got to live a little bit the same thing with uh, Dominique Ducharme a couple of years ago. And, uh, you know, Jean came in and players, I, I wouldn't say they disrespect this respect them, but they, they were not respecting him at all as, as a head coach. And uh, and uh, I saw those guys, those veterans, taking charge of the room, taking charge of the game, taking charge of uh, of everything. And then, uh, hey. Is it safe, Pierre, is it safe to say that Jean Perron and Dominic Ducharme at two different times had big shoes to fill because of their, you know, the guys yeah, that were yeah, there yeah, yeah, before yeah, them, yeah, right? Yeah, definitely. And, they, they definitely, definitely, they did, and they did. They, they didn't have a ton of experience, and it was yeah. maybe it was maybe too much too soon. They did, they did, and uh, you know, like if I take the team from the '86 and then '93 and then 2021, uh, good old veterans, guys that had experience, yeah, that have seen other coaches and uh, stuff like that. So. One of the things that made me laugh in the book is that the champagne is on ice, game five in Calgary. And at one point, uh, you guys are you're what you're out of beer. And you knock on the door of the equipment manager of the Calgary Flames, yeah. and you say to him, Can you help me out? We ran out of beer. And he politely, or maybe not politely, but closes the door on your face. And three years later, Calgary comes to Montreal, they win the cup. And he has his assistant knock on your door and ask you for beer. And you told him that Molson is across the street if they want to go and buy some. <laughs> hey, uh, Chris Nyland is going to be my guest tomorrow night. I know you talked about him in the book. You actually talked about a lot of the tough guys on the team. Yeah. And and you said that Chris was a guy who actually loved to fight. Can you, yeah. can you give me a good Chris Nyland story so we can replay it for him tomorrow night? Oh, well, Chris... Uh... What a man, honestly. What a man. What a team guy. Uh, I had a lot of tough guys over the years. Very good tough guys. But uh, Knuckles is a big, big heart. Um, I remember, like, uh, when I first came in, uh, I was just a kid from Sherbrooke. And uh, Chris and his wife took me to his house, offered me for a nice dinner and stuff like that as a welcome. In the family of the Canadians, so that, that this is this is huge. He's still this doing it today, by the way, because he had Jordan Harris and Arbor Jack guy at his house in Saint Anne de Bellevue a couple of weeks ago, and he cooked oh, them a nice he? dinner. Really? That, yeah. that, does, that doesn't surprise me. That doesn't yeah. surprise. That's Chris Nyland. I, I, it was so tough. I remember, like uh, after a game in Boston, I guess he fought with uh, was it Jay Miller or something, and yeah. then. And then they, they they came across each other under the garden, you know, in, in the hallway. And then <laughs> Chris went at, went right after him. Uh, you know that that's Chris Nyland. Oh, that yeah. was that was the night where he basically slapped Kenny Lindsman. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> and so that that up. is Chris Nyland. That guy is unbelievable. Seriously. Yeah, you know what? Yeah, if you're uh, you know, if you're in a dark alley and uh, and the two or three people approach you. If you can have one guy by your side, I think Knuckles would be one. John exactly. Kordick, you, you talk about him. 
the story that really got to me was, I think it was in Verdun that you were practicing one day, if my reading serves me well. And uh, uh, there was something that went on between members of the fire department and the police department. And John Cordick saw them. Was it in Verdun, Pierre? Was it in it Verdun at Verdun, the auditorium? Yes. John Cordick saw the police officers and in a panic uh, makes his way off the ice, goes to the locker room. And did you follow him into the locker room? Well, I did because I wasn't sure if he was sick or if he had something that, you know, some equipment issue, something like that. So I kind of follow him, not not right behind him, but I, I, I gave him like a three seconds, like a minute. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I kind of follow him. And when he was getting back on the ice, uh, he was kind of hiding something in his hockey pan. So I could see that clearly. And I could see in his eyes, the, the fear in his eyes, because, you know, he saw, like I said, it, it, like you mentioned, there was a few cub back there, and there was always a few cub, but it was like maybe more than usual. Maybe it was six or eight of them. Yeah. And I guess he panicked. And and then he was uh, going back on the ice, hiding something in his pan. And, and you know, when this problem came up afterward, uh, actually back then was uh, he had a lot of uh, nose bleeding and different kind of things, but I wasn't an expert in the in the drug or cocaine or whatever. Yeah, that's but cocaine. afterward we kind of I uh, kind of you know add everything like one plus one makes two and two plus two makes four and then you know I kept adding uh, that kind of stuff. So definitely that time he, he was adding something. There were several coaching changes along the way, and there were several general managers that you had a chance to work with. But I want to talk to you about a couple of my favorite players, former Montreal Canadiens. Uh, one of them is not really in the book all that much, um, so no good or bad. But I, you know, the flower obviously was my idol. Uh, but after him, it was Stefan Richer, two times 50 goal scorer in a three-year span. Is there? Is there... Um, what did you think of Rich? Rich, I love Rich. I love yeah. Rich. He's a great guy. Uh, he's a different guy. Um, I'm not sure if he loved the game. He was very good at the game. He was a very good, very good like sports guy, like uh, hockey and baseball and all kind of stuff. Uh, I love Rich. Uh, there's a lot of guys like that. I. I I couldn't go like so long with, you know, uh, there's, I had like 453 players <laughs> in all those years. Someone, yeah. someone uh, gave that to me the other day. So I, I, I just couldn't like uh, extend of those players. Uh, a lot of guys that I love very much. And uh, I could say like Francis Bouillon and Rich and, uh, and Breezer and uh, a lot of guys. I just couldn't go too long with those guys. I just, you know, I kept the, the most important people I thought with the team. And but but Stefan Rich definitely is he's, he's, he's your gentleman. He's one of but you, you so you got the feeling as great as Rich was. Um yeah. he, he's a guy that was great. He was great, he was a natural talent. Yeah. But but he there was some inconsistency. Exactly. And you think because he didn't love the game as much as You'd want a guy with all that talent to love the I game don't because think if he, he would have, exactly. he would have reached think, bigger heights, right? Exactly. I don't think he did, and I thought he, he said it himself. I don't think he loved pressure. A little bit like Kovalev. I had Kovi, and Kovi is a uh, Kovi is the uh, probably the best talented player I had in Montreal, and Kovi was that way. He's like a great guy, so strong, physically strong, just like Rich. Rich is a force of nature. And Kovalev was the same, but he didn't he didn't want to do too much because he didn't want to have you know people on his back. He, that guy could have scored two three goals a game, uh, just, you know. The, the, obviously not, but uh, just he just uh, as a, as a picture. And Kovi didn't want to have like th that kind of pressure game after game after game Montreal. So he was kind of floating around a bit, and, yeah. and, and you know. Uh, Reef was the same, I guess. I know you were a big fan of Saku. You mentioned that in your book, a lot of people were. When he heard uh, that you were looking for a place to stay, he graciously offered up the keys to his condo instead. You yes. can stay there for the summer. I'm going back to Finland and enjoy all the wine that you want. But Alex Kovalev was on BPM Sports yesterday with George Larac. 
And he said that Saku was a good captain, but he got the feeling that Saku probably thought that Alex wanted to take um, his spot in terms of being the crowd favorite, in terms of being the important player on the team, in terms of wanting the spotlight. And he says he thinks it made Saku uncomfortable. So he had a talk with Saku to say to Saku, you know, Saku, you don't have to worry. I, I don't want, you know, to be the best over you. You be your best version of yourself. I'll be my best version of myself. Together, let's try and help the team win. So my question to you is, uh, because I know how much you liked Kovalev, and I know how much you liked Koivu. Was there a problem between the two? I don't think it was. Uh, knowing Saku, he's, uh, you know, he's coming from Finland. He's been born and raised and, and, and raised by great parents. And usually Finnish players are very, very respectful. And... And Saku probably knew like the stature of Kovi. And but honestly, I don't recall or remember any kind of thing like that. Maybe that was between them. But uh, I, I know that Kovi was bigger than nature and Saku kind of knew it. Maybe he felt uh, a little bit under how should I say this? He felt that it should be Kovi and he felt like Kovi maybe wanted it, but that, that's not true at all. I mean, Kovi, Kovi didn't care, honestly. He just, he was just happy to be in Montreal. He was happy to be part of the team. And I guess if they had that discussion, honestly, I, I have no idea about that. All right. Um, at one point, the, you, know, you win the cup in 1993. Um, talk to me about that cup and how it was different for you than 86. Well, first of all, I was uh, more, uh, personally, I was more as um, Montreal Canadiens. In 86, I was coming from Sherbrooke. And in 93, well, I was there since the beginning. I yeah. saw the old team uh, getting together. I saw, I had a lot of guys that I had in Sherbrooke back then. The Brian Scourdon, the Patrick Wall, well, those guys that I knew very well. And then back in 93, and I had a lot of guys I had so many respect for them, like Brand Bellows, guys that tough guys, tough guys, not tough guys like fighters, tough guys like they had the grit, they had they, they had the work ethic, and uh, that's how that team became a solid team. Yeah, uh, I, I could see like that was very similar to uh, 2021, very similar. Uh, Corey Perry came in, and uh, you know Shea Weber and Terry yeah. and those guys. So '93, Eric Stahl. was a bunch of guys that were like uh, hard working guy, hard working guys. I mean, and uh, they were like everything came together with yeah. Patrick in the back, and uh, great, great uh, coaching with uh, Jacques Demers. Yeah, so the turning that was, point that was course. amazing too. Yeah, Pierre, if I can, pardon me. The turning point in that series, of course, is the illegal stick called on Marty McSorley. Yes. Everyone in Montreal, as you have heard by now, has had different theories. Somebody went, they went, uh, you know, into the locker room to take a look yeah. at the sticks, yeah. or they took a picture of the sticks, or it was Doc who was in the visiting locker room that tipped off somebody with the Canadians. You say in the book, it's not that. It was obvious to the eye, and it was Guy Carboneau yes. who told Jock Demers. Yeah. But so, you had a say uh, in that too, though. Yeah, exactly, Tony. Uh, not at all. I mean, even if a GM or a coach would ask me to go and measure a stick in their room or at night or whatever, I would have never, ever, ever done it. Uh, never done. Uh, seriously. So his curve was so big, so obvious that Carbonell made the call. Uh, I remember he went to Jacques Demers and then Jacques turned to me uh, quickly and said, uh, what do you think? Well, I said, obviously it's illegal. I mean, there was sometimes, you know, even today, the curve, it, 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 the legal curve is bigger, so it's kind of tough to call. Mm -hmm. But back then, that was huge. It was a big mistake with his part, honestly. So uh, every team had illegal sticks. We had some too. And my coaches always asked me to make sure the guy, the players knew that his stick was illegal. And they always make sure that uh, I, you know, let's say like halfway through the third, 
Mm -hmm. uh, we were leading by a goal or two, something tight. Mm -hmm. Well, I was my job was to tell the, the players to change your sticks, to change sticks for a legal one. So, but I never fought with them. I never argued with them. I just kind of told them if they wanted to do it, they did it. And not they they, they, they were the one that taking a chance. Hey, Pierre, remember that year? And of course you do. The year that they won the cup in 93, the 92, 93 season, yeah. the Canadians start the season badly. And uh, I, I think it's at the start of the season or preseason. I don't remember, but Jacques Demers calls for the guys to come into the room at six o'clock. Yeah for practice could you yeah. imagine if that would happen today in 2022 <laughs> my god the players association obviously would never allow it but what was it it was a 7 a.m practice and be uh be in the room for 6 a.m i think right yeah that was <laughs> that was something like that like uh trainer's hours <laughs> <laughs> a day a morning following a game and um i remember like michelle terrier did it too uh oh yeah one times and the bell setter and guys were not happy at all. I mean, wow. coming from Jacques Demers, that was one thing. Coming from Michel Terry, he was a young coach back then. And uh, uh, I remember uh, Doug Gilmore said, I I'll never go on the ice tomorrow morning. No, not a chance. And he didn't do it. He just came in and uh, he pretended to have some treatment, stuff like that, but he didn't do it. So, oh, wow. I That's mean, those are, those are calls. That's Those are calls made by veteran coaches. That yeah. doesn't happen too often. I, I hear you. Uh, the Mares was pretty funny. Uh, Paul DiPietro's late for a curfew, <laughs> and he uh, and uh, he uh, he puts his equipment inside. What is it? The jacuzzi, the hot tub, and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Wet, and he says he can't dry the equipment. Nobody help him out, and then exactly. DiPietro's got to put it on and I, practice with it. I remember this like it was yesterday. Uh, Jacques, it was early in the morning. Storm in the room. Storm in the room. He was so mad. Where's the Petro's equipment? You know, so I just I showed him what's right there. He grabbed the gear himself. He just grabbed everything himself, threw it in the hot tub, and then he made a couple of trips, you know, because there's a lot of yeah. gear. Everything, helmets and gloves, and everything. And then he said, Don't ever touch it. Don't touch it. I won't see him. So guys were coming in, players were coming in like uh in the room one by one, and they had to go. Uh, they had to walk in front of the hot tub to, to get to the rescue room. And one after one, just kept going. <laughs> and they were asking us, what's going on? Uh, well, go see the coach. <laughs> I don't know. That's Paul's gear. And then uh, that was that was something very, very special. Pierre, five games into the 95 season, Serge Savard and Jacques Demers are relieved of their duties. Ray Jean Houle comes in as the new general manager. Mario Trombley is the coach with Shutt and Cornway as his assistants. When you saw that go down, you immediately thought what? Well, I, I honestly, I thought there was great people coming in, but there's such a lack of experience. And I thought we're in trouble for a couple of years, and we did. Uh, again, I love those guys. I love Ivan. I love Mario. I love those guys. But mm -hmm. I mean, hey, you have to be in your right spot at the right time, right? Yeah. And and then uh, yeah and and it was like that was uh, Mr. Corey's big mistake I guess yeah and uh, and then we were in trouble for a few years back in the mid nineties yeah. when well, Patrick we all, left and all that yeah we all remember Patrick Waugh staying in goal versus Detroit a game at home where he was in goal for nine yeah. goals against and then the words were exchanged he and Mario Tremblay and then he told Ronald Corey it's my last game in Montreal but my question to you is. You know, you can sense the tension between the two before that game, and it can't just be one game. How bad was it between Mario Tremblay and Patrick Waugh? Well, it was a matter of time. It was a matter of time, honestly. It wasn't really bad, but you can tell, like, uh, Patrick was taking Mario lightly, and Mario, with his big heart, uh, wanted to do the best as he could with the team. And uh, that was kind of a tension. Uh, apparently, I wasn't there, but apparently the very first meeting they had, like, uh, Patrick almost started laughing when Mario was talking, and then Mario took it really bad, I guess, and which which is which is normal. Yeah. But I wasn't there again. I just, I was told that. And then uh, afterward, well, it's just, you could tell, you could feel attention, nothing major. We could feel like a little bit of, uh, uh, should I say this? Uh, mm -hmm. Two, two, two strong guys in the same room. Two strong characters. 
Exactly. So and then uh, and then exploded that night. And, and Mario, and knowing that Patrick was a veteran and a leader, he needs to have Patrick on board. And if he thinks Patrick's not going to be on board because Patrick's not going to take him seriously or ridicule him, then Mario probably thinks he's not going to end up having the respect of the room. Definitely. Definitely. So both both were kind of wrong. But, hey, it's and history. It is what it is. And that was a very, a very sad moment in the Montreal Canadiens history. Uh, I was part of it. And then uh, Patrick... Uh, uh, Patrick went to meet with his uh, agent after after the game. Uh, we walked him through the uh, like the, the uh, ice room of the yeah. National Forum, the, the compressor, whatever room. Then, then yeah. he met with uh, Bob Sove, and then they went on. And then the next day, it was done. You know, Patrick was ready to come back. I know that for a fact. He was willing to uh, excuse himself and you know just forget about this and then come back and then. That wasn't the case with the, uh, I, I guess it was Mr. Cord's call, I think. So. Pierre, I won't keep you much longer because your time is so appreciated, but there's so many hot topics that I don't know if I'm going to get a chance to do this again, so we have to do it now. So bear with me. How bad was it between Pacioretty and Subban? It wasn't the war. It was just like, well, PK is PK, right? So PK yeah. was he's a great, great, uh, I love PK, like... Uh, he was. He had a big heart. He was very polite and all that. But Piqué was Piqué in a sense of uh, he needed attention. He needed attention so bad all the time, and it did fit well with Patch. So they had many, many arguments. Um, sometimes I could hear them from my office, and uh, it doesn't mean they were fighting every day. But so that was uh, that was like. Uh, you could you could feel you could tell the difference between the two guys. Some guys were um, they didn't really like the way PK was acting, but they you know they they kind of didn't make a big thing out of it. But Pat just couldn't stand it, I guess. PK had some guys in the room. He had Brandon Prust. He had Dale Weiss. I think he had Alex yep. Galchenyuk. But Pat already thought that PK was not buying in, and because of that. He was swaying some guys towards him, and Pacioretty, as the captain, wanted everyone to buy in, and he thought that PK was hurting his cause in that respect, right? Maybe that's what it is. Maybe yeah. that's what it is, honestly. I just, I just, I, just I, I can't say for sure, but that's probably what it was. What What do you think would have happened if PK Subban, it's hypothetical, if he would have been captain? Well, PK is PK, and... Uh, Players voted that year, right? Yeah. Players voted that year, and I that from what I hear, there was only one vote for PK, which was probably coming from PK. <laughs> wow. But I don't and, understand how Weiss and Preston didn't vote for him. Pardon? Me? I because I, I heard the I think it was nineteen to two or something. The vote I uh, heard too. nineteen to two or nineteen to one or whatever. But I, I I thought it was only one. I didn't count the vote, but from what I heard. But uh, but anyways, I mean, players didn't have anything against PK really but PK the way it was acting the way it was acting to be the captain would have been a little bit too much I think do you think that some as much as he was extravagant and outgoing and had that personality which was kind of new to hockey players right he had a lot of people said he had more of a basketball personality for a hockey player back in the day yeah, but do you think that there was also a little bit of jealousy because he had such a huge social media following? He was the darling of big companies and big sponsors. He was making big money. He had that huge contract. Do you think there was a little bit of jealousy? Because I do. Tony, I wouldn't say this. No, because because a team is a team, and usually, like hockey players, or I don't know any other sports, but. To me, hockey is my game, right? I've been hockey for so long. Mm -hmm. To me, hockey players, this year team as a team, PK was seeing himself as himself and then the team. So uh, that's the way I see it. Again, mm -hmm. he was very polite, nice guy, but PK was PK in front of everything else. So and, and in hockey, you have to forget about yourself and think about the team. Like so many great players did over the years, 
the uh, the the Carbono, the Nylons, or those guys, the Bob Gaines, and you, mm. you can go for two hours. And uh, I believe that's what that that's what it was. I mean, PK, he did a lot of nice stuff. Uh, I remember yeah. doing something for hospitals, doing something for kids. But he always had he always had his TV crew around him, filming everything, putting his web website and all that. That was a bothering for everybody. I mean. I had players going to hospitals, to the St. Justine hospitals, visiting kids and stuff like that, and no one heard about it. So PK was always, unfortunately, he had to have his crew with him, had to be on TV, had to be everybody. So when you're a team captain, you don't do that. Hey, Pierre, if you would have had a vote back then, out of all the players on the team, who would you have voted for captain? What? Who would you have voted for captain out of all the players on the team? That year? Yeah. Nobody. Wow. Uh, nobody. To me, I always said it, a captain is not that important. If you don't have the right guy, to me, it's not that important. Because like these days, let's say, I'm sure, Martin St. Louis, or, or when uh, Claude Julien was there, or Dom Charm, mm -hmm. when they want to talk something like changing practice hours or some changing stuff like that, the coaches were not calling just the captain or the assistant captains. They were calling the five, six, seven veterans. Like uh, that, like a couple of years ago, that was going to be, it was going to be like Webby, Corey Perry, Toffoli, those guys. Mm -hmm. And then there was a group decision. So a captain to me, it is, but it's not. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to say it's it's, it's 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 useless, but in a room like all the veterans, all the, all the players, they they all chip in, they all talk, they all uh, bring the team their own way. Uh -huh. A captain is there for, you know, he's there for face off official things, like uh -huh. if you will, with the team. But to me, if you don't have a right guy, rather not have any captain. To me. PK Subban gets traded to Nashville, and you're yep. one of the first one who actually sees it coming. Recall the story because your phone rang at one point. Yeah. I, actually, I was in Nashville. Uh, I was in Nashville in the convention, our, uh, our uh, association convention. And that was uh, 6 o'clock in the morning, and then the phone, my phone rang. And usually I always turn my phone off. But in Nashville, you, you don't go to bed at nine o'clock, and it's 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 kind of a party city, which I, I you know I, I enjoy too. So uh, six a.m. my phone rang, and I, I just kind of woke up, and I, I saw my phone, Mark Bergeron. So I said, "Holy smokes!" So it's in June, like it's mid mid June or something like that. So I answered the phone, and the uh, bird just he just went right away. Just do, hey, Jerv, how you doing? He has no clue I'm in Nashville. So uh, hey, Jerv. Uh, you had Shea Weber on, as, uh, you know, Olympics and stuff like that. Uh, how is he? My God, Shea Weber is like, uh, he, he's huge. He's huge. I, I told Mark, so, well, do I start? Where do I, uh, you know, Burge is like a great teammate. He's big. He's strong. He's good. He's well-respected and, and all that. You know, I went on for a couple of minutes. So he told me, so, so it says uh, for uh, Piggy Shuban, that, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> I started laughing. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> so I said, uh, well, you better call the league right now and uh, before they change their mind, <laughs> do something about it. So I thought it was unbelievable uh, from the Nashville Predators. And then from I heard afterward, uh, like players were like crazy, crazy players. They, they couldn't believe. You know, there's there's so many issues I can get to. So I'm going to tell you very quickly what I want to talk about next. Uh, Max Pacioretty is one. Dominic Ducharme is another. So let's make it as fast as we can so that you can get to bed because it's it's getting a little bit late, I know. Um, Max Pacioretty, you went as far as to say that you just didn't think he was a good person, period. Correct me if I'm wrong, right? Yes, correct. So talk to me about that because... That was a really, really strong opinion. Kind of like, wow, he well, just it, is. it is, and uh, I, I still think of it. I mean, how should I say this? It was like uh, 
when he came in, it was young, it was fine. And then uh, with uh, the years, I, I, maybe he was brought up like uh, differently with, uh, you know, his family had money and stuff like that. He was like the king uh, everywhere he went. And then uh, he is had entitled, kind of is a entitlement selfish the, attitude. Is, it, is, 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 without putting words in your mouth, but is spoiled or entitlement what you're trying to get to? Kind, kind of. Kind, kind of, of okay. Think, kind of. And then uh, and he came in and uh, we had that, uh, well, argument about his his, uh, his machine that he wants to bring on the road. And I, I know that machine, by the way, the Desmotech, because yeah, Desmotech, yeah, my exactly. boys play soccer. I believe Paul Gagne is the distributor, okay? okay, because they've used that machine before. And it's for um, groin injury prevention, I think. Yeah, stretching and yeah. stuff like that. But but back then, my uh, all the uh, the strength coach we had, they they were not sure about the machine. They thought it was more dangerous than anything else. Kerry was using it all. Kerry was using it uh, as well, and they were like kind of afraid that Kerry's using it. But Pat was very big on it, and I had no room. I had you know what I, I I've never seen it to players if it makes sense, but I had no room. That machine in a trunk was taking it was pretty heavy was taking a lot of space and what that goes what it be, goes it goes in a metal case it does it not yeah fold yeah up? it's kind of a big trunk big does case it fold then, up or it, does it fold the machine folds it goes in a case or exactly but still okay. the case is pretty big pretty heavy okay and our truck was full our truck was more than full and you know like the uh, medical guys that were setting up a clinic at the hotel so they needed uh, like two massage tables and a couple of trunks and this and that I told Patch, I said, Patch, if I had room, I'd be more than happy to bring it. We have no room. The truck was more than full. The plane was more than full. I even talked to my uh, to our uh, mechanic with Air Canada, and I kind of explained to him, what about, he said, Jerv, I don't know. If, if I bring this, I have to drop something else. What else can we drop? Well, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, I told the medical guy, I said, yeah, well, if you want to drop a trunk, We'll bring the machine, but they, they you know, they, well, what we bring, we need it. So, anyways, I was disappointed with Pat because in my face, he was telling me, yeah, he understood, yeah, that's okay, no problem, there. But every single time I was going around and going with other people, it, it, it came to the GM, it came to Mark, it came to, came to all the medical guys, it came to all those guys that were coming to me one after one. Every single time I said, you know, I, I have no room. And I was going to patch every time. Patch, I know but you want to, I have no room. And he went around and even one day the gym came in. Mark came to my office. Uh, yeah, Patch talked to me about that machine. I said, Burge, I have no room. I, and I showed him, I took a picture. I showed him the truck was like at the door. The, 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 the truck driver at Pierre Bar, which been doing this for years, he couldn't even, he could barely shut the door of the truck. And I, I and I told my Air Canada mechanics, okay, if we bring that thing on a taxi or on the bus or different way, I said Pierre, I have no room. Okay, I have so no room. I know you've heard this already, so it won't make you uncomfortable. I'll bring it up because it's been yeah, out yeah, there. Yeah. You've heard it. What do you say um, to the notion that was put out there that there was a metal one of these metal road cases that was in? Uh, that you guys brought with you, which was to bring back wine. No, not at all. Not at all. Not, not at true. All. I mean, that is that is unbelievable. When I heard that, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. If I had no room for his machine, I had no room. I always brought the wine I could bring. Always like I never never brought cases of wine. I just we were allowed like two bottles every forty eight hours. Uh, sometimes I had my assistant to bring two, me too, and uh, we're always legal. But bring cases of wine, that's not true at all. So there was not one road case which was no, used to bring not back wine all, bottles or anything like all. that? All, okay. my, all our cases, they were like uh, uh, jerseys and equipment and all that. They were full. They were more than full. So, I mean, not there's, at all. There's one thing you said about Pacioretty. I think you said if they would win the game, if the Canadians would win the game big, 10-1, whatever, but Pacioretty doesn't score. Yep. wasn't happy. Now, I don't yep. have a hockey background in terms of being a former player, but a former coach told me 
all the guys are like that. They all want to score. Koivu was like that. He would want to score. And if he wouldn't score, he wouldn't be happy either. True or false in your opinion? I don't agree. You don't agree, don't agree. eh? Maybe Seku was like that a little bit. He's, he's mentioning Seku, maybe. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, nope. I've seen players like, I've seen so many players. The team was winning 6-1. They had no points and they'd be very happy. So I don't agree with that at all. You think Carey Price has played his last game in the National Hockey League? Unfortunately, I think so. I don't have any scoop. I don't have any direct connection, but I, I think so. Dominic Ducharme, you said he was a very disorganized coach and the guys had a lot of respect for uh, Luke Richardson. My question to you is, have you since had a chance to talk to Dominic Ducharme? Because I know that he took it badly. I know. He sent me a text. He's actually the, very, he's the only one that has, you know, I know there's a couple of pe people not too happy. He's the only one that had sent me a text the very first day. And uh, I kind of answered to you, to him, and he kind of got back to me, and uh, but very politely, very politely. And I told him, I said, Dominic, if you want to talk about it more, just give me a call, and we can talk about it anytime. Did he call I you? Was, it looks like I was mean, but I was very good to those guys, to those people, like Burge, and I could have been like a lot meaner than I was. I didn't want to extend it. I didn't want to diminish them or, the, you know, you know what I mean? Bergevin, I, didn't I think, want to do I think that. you said he dressed like an adolescent and that he would show up to practices wearing shorts and sandals and Claude well, Julien wasn't crazy about it. And it, it, it not, was not, not, all, not all the time, but sometimes, you know, and then, and Burge was Burge was like, uh, uh, a, a teenager, an older teenager and was dressing like this. And, uh, I know Claude didn't like it at all because Claude, Claude is like a hockey, hockey man, just like uh, Jeff Gordon is, just like Ken Hughes are. You know, th those guys are. They all, they just they don't have suits and tie all the time. It's just it's, they came well dressed. They came like they behave like the way, as a uh, hockey management should be behaving, and uh, they come in. They're relaxed. They're focused. They're it's fun. You know, actually, I got to know them like the, my last four months with Marty St. Louis and then Habs are in good hands. I'm, I'm convinced of that. Um, how bad was Shea Weber hurt in the Stanley Cup final? Oh, big time, big time. That guy was suffering so much, suffering so much. Uh, it was tough on him. His last season, last playoffs, that was very tough on him. And uh, I could feel it like he was walking the rink and the, the pain, mm -hmm. the pain in his face uh, all the time. So Webby, uh, you know, after uh, after our loss in uh, Tampa, mm -hmm. I could tell that was his last game. I could feel it because it was, he was like he had so much pain, so much he was crying like a baby, like for for half an hour, and uh, I could feel something different was happening. You know, Pierre, there's a lot of stories I didn't get to, which I actually did it on purpose because I want people to go out and buy the book. Okay? okay. So I probably touched on, I don't know, about 15 topics or so, but there's probably about 40 plus topics, 50 plus topics in this book, which is 286 pages. And it's Ocar du Vassiade. And a couple of days ago, you launched the English version, correct? Yes. So where can those who are watching right now on YouTube live, Facebook okay. live, Twitter live, where can they pick up the book? Because I'm okay. sure some of them are going away on vacation for the holidays. So, some of them will be home in the holidays. They want to read the book. So, Tony, the English version, I've been pushing for it since uh, since day one. Uh, because I know the uh, Anglophone community in Montreal is big. I know Habs fans uh, out west and Maritimes and all that are big. So, uh, starting Friday, it's available on uh, Kindle yes. and on Kobo. And then uh, the 19th, I believe, the hard copies are coming in, uh, will be uh, Indigo. They bought like 8,000 copies and uh, they'll uh, Indigo chapters. So you yeah. can order right now on Indigo chapters and then they'll uh, ship it to you as soon as it comes in. By the way, and Costco was selling your book too, right? Eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Costco. Renault and, uh, Bray. Like, it's been crazy. We sold like uh, so far like 45,000 books. 
and there's another 25,000 coming in. And uh, it's been crazy. And I heard, of course, a, a few people at the beginning weren't happy, but the fans, the people, yeah, are so happy about it. I just heard like so many good things. When all is said and done, you might end up getting close to 100,000 copies. It's possible. No? Well, right now, we have to, uh, if you take the French English one, it's like 83,000. So you're, you're going to pass. I, I wouldn't 000. be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised. You're going to pass. And, and look, you've been so much in demand. You've done the tour of the province of Quebec. People have been in lines hundreds at a time. You've been selling a lot of copies. Yeah. The book has been a huge success. I have to tell you, Matthias Brunet is a personal friend of mine. I love the guy. I think he's he's an incredible writer. I think he did an incredible he job. Is. I he think is. I think you chose the right guy to work with. He did. And Matthias. Yeah. He did a hell of a job, Matthias, and uh, he did a hell of a job. Honestly, I chose him because not only because it was the very first one, because I liked the way he was acting in the dressing room. I was uh, I liked the way he's writing, and then uh, when uh, Richard Baudry and I got together, and it was time to find uh, the guy to write it, I told uh, Richard, I said, I got to ask Matthias because he's the very first one to to, get to offer me like years ago. And he said, well, you'd probably be too busy for that. He's with press and this and that. I said, well, I got to ask him because, uh, you know, I got to ask him. And I called uh, Matthias right away and he said, yes, right away. And then we did it within uh, three months. Like within meeting, three months. Uh, waiting almost every day. Um, he, he's running fast. He's running really fast. So we met like almost every day at his house, my house, or Zoom and whatever. How, how many how many bottles of wine did you drink during that time? <laughs> <laughs> Went through quite a few. <laughs> hey, hey, Pierre, uh, when I told you 45 minutes, about 55 minutes ago, I could almost uh, feel that your heart was about to stop, but you stuck with it. I'm sorry I kept you so long. I really appreciate you taking That's the okay, time. Tony. I know everyone that is watching is very, very um, appreciative of the fact that you came on tonight. Your huge contributions to this podcast here. I thank you very much for that. I got the book. I've recommended it to others. What's a Jerv's favorite wine? I heard he's a huge vino aficionado, says Habs Cave. What's your favorite wine, Jerv? Oh, my. I have uh, so many good ones. Uh, I'm more like a France guy, you know. Uh, wine from the Rhone, Bordeaux, Burgundy, definitely. Oh, but I love oh. all good wines. So somebody I... I like a good glass of wine, but I'm not a huge wine drinker. And when I do drink wine, I usually get headaches. And somebody told me, I think it's a Bordeaux or a Bourgogne. They said, drink one of those and you won't get a headache. Is that true? Am I, or was I given the right information here I, or not? I never had a headache. <laughs> <laughs> Even with Italian or whatever. So maybe, I don't know, maybe I was born for it. <laughs> Hey, Pierre, enjoy your retirement. What are your plans? What are your plans to do here for the rest of your life? What do you want to do? Thanks, Tony. Uh, I'm doing like uh, part-time radio, French video. I did a few gigs with RDS. Uh, we have a plan after the holidays with the, the Canadians. Uh, I'll do some special tour of the dressing room. Mm -hmm. I guess they're going to call it like uh, Pierre Jervé experience or something like that. So people uh, are going to pay and they're going to spend like an hour and a half or two hours with me. Uh, going through the old dressing rooms in Montreal uh, from A to Z and uh, stories and uh, so know, the Canadians about... are the Canadians are obviously okay with what you oh you know, you coming out with the book yeah, this... I mean my, my the book launching was at the Bell Center uh, they read the book before and uh, I mean to the organization I'm really really good and I'm, I'll be good till I die honestly the, those people are great the organize I, I so much fun with the uh, Molson family, uh, Jeff today with the Gillettes. And uh, I mean, oh, that oh. organization is huge to me. I know I said I was going to end it, but no, no, I just thought of something. One more, one more. Go ahead. That's fine. Marty St. Louis speech to the players, his first impression when he came in that everyone's talking about that. He blew them away that Josh Anderson said, wow, I know you don't talk like Marty and you can't possibly remember everything, but in a nutshell, can you give us, can you give all of us here a gist of what he was saying, what his message was that night? Well, his message was, uh, he came in, he said, I'm a new coach. I haven't coached like your level. I've been playing your level and it's time to have fun. His message was basically to have fun, to change things around, 
to work hard and have fun and uh, to to you know it was going to change a little bit of uh, the, the game plan and that was his message that basically but that was very nice loud and clear and guys loved it I love this guy. I just I get the feeling the Canadians are in good hands with Gorton, they with are. Hughes, and with they Marty St. Louis. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, enjoy your retirement once Thank again. You, Merci Appreciate beaucoup. It. Thank you very All right. much. Oh, George Larac and Yellow. Do we have what George Larac said? Nope. Uh, it's funny. Can we bring it up. Pierre Gervais is going to be my guest tomorrow night, former Canadian That's amazing. manager. That's amazing. And, and he you said, know, you know, Pierre Gervais is the best uh, equipment manager I've ever had in all my team in NHL during my 13 year career. He's the best. He's the nicest guy. We all loved him. He was amazing. There you have it. That awesome. was George Larac last night right awesome. here on the Sick Podcast. Thank you very much. Have a great retirement. Take care. Thank all the you, best Tony. to you. Thank okay. you. Okay. Merci beaucoup. There you have it. Pierre Gervais with the Montreal Canadiens for over 35 years. A shout out to Playground. They have over 600 machines, poker tournaments, and Playground casino games, daily promotions, and unmatched customer service. Why go anywhere else? Located just over the Mercier Bridge, only minutes from downtown Montreal. And now it's time to go for gold. Go for gold. A daily World Cup report. Alfonso Davies keeps it himself. Goal! Presented by Bijou Tree Bossy. Goal for Gold is brought to you by Bijouteri Bassi. Bijouteri Bassi has provided professional service and fine jewelry for over 30 years. As a matter of fact, Agnello's wife, Rosa, and his daughter, Juliana, went to see the great Jenny Dioris at Bijouteri Bassi, uh, Bijouteri Bassi earlier today. Visit the store at 9640 Boulevard St. Michel in Montreal the way they did. You can call them at 514-387-9528. In one of the two semifinals... It was Argentina versus Croatia earlier this afternoon at 2 p.m. Eastern. And we all knew that if Argentina was going to get it done, Lionel Messi had to play a big role in it. And boy, oh boy, did he ever. He scored the first one on a penalty kick. He assisted on the third one in what was a work of beauty because he took Guardiol to the outside and put the dipsy doodle on him, made his way by him, who's been, by the way, the central defender of the tournament thus far, the youngster has, for Croatia. He went around them like he wasn't even there, and then he distributed a beautiful pass, which was converted, and Argentina with a huge, huge, very impressive 3 nothing win over Croatia. Argentina getting better as the tournament goes on. Who are they going to play in the final? We're going to find out tomorrow afternoon because tomorrow afternoon at 2 p.m., it's going to be France versus Morocco. Does Morocco's Cinderella story continue? Thus far, they have only conceded one goal. It was actually an own goal with former Montrealer, Yesin Bono, the goalkeeper, was born in Montreal left at one year of age, but he'll always be one of us. And tomorrow we're going to find out who's going to square off versus Argentina because the World Cup final of Qatar 2022 will take place Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Eastern. Argentina is in. Will it be France or will it be Morocco? We'll find out tomorrow. To you, my sick army, I say thank you very much for tuning in via Facebook Live, Twitter Live, and YouTube Live. Special thanks. To La Cage, to 8.6 Beer, and Energy Transportation Group, and for all of you for watching. And thank you very much, Pierre Gervais, for your time. We had a great chat. Tell your friends about it. This podcast is going to take off. It's going to be better and better and better and better. We're taking over Montreal. Knuckles will join me tomorrow night. I'm Marinero. <laughs> And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow The Sick Podcast with Tony Marinero on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts. The Sick Podcast is brought to you by Energy Transportation Group. Driven to be different. 8.6. Intense by nature. And La Cage. If the last time you went to La Cage was when the Habs won the cup, it's time you went back to La Cage. The menu will surprise you.